Avatar The Last Airbender is a popular show in the watching things community. M. Night Shyamalan's Spongebob Squarepants makes more direct references to death than the entire Avatar franchise. We do that for 40 years and then we die. Avatar is a show with great acting. <laughs> that, that image should do it. Are you really going to compare Avatar The Last Airbender to the Nazis? No, it's something far worse. It's Neville Chamberlain. No, no. The heroes defeat Nazism and fascism and imperialism and vagueism through pluck and gumption and an unyielding belief in the liberal delusions of reform and hope and reinforcing the social and political power structures because those aren't the problem, just the people at the top are the problem because they're mean and they do bad things. So just swap out the leaders. Everything will work out. I never watched Avatar The Last Airbender when I was a kid. Everyone at school made fun of it, as did my cousins and everyone. Because I was an impressionable child and wanted to conform in third grade, I didn't watch the show. When Avatar recently dropped on Netflix, everyone was screaming every which way and I just want to know where you people were in grade school. Apparently I was the only person that experienced this, but it means that when I watched it recently for the first time, I was not clouded by nostalgia. I was only clouded by emotional damage caused by grade school bullies and the fact that my dad never hugged me. And you know what? Avatar's really good. There it is. That's my hot take. That's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you all for my subscribers and commentators ters. This video was a long time in the making and uh, um, um, we're going to have to do the political analysis that I mentioned in the title, aren't we? Well... This, this is not going to be contentious at all. Detroit robbery, that's a fact. And the body said, dip, dip, get back. Jack, well, you got to be tough, but there's a good time to be happy. During the final episodes of Avatar, I honed in on the parallel fights of Aang versus Ozai and Zuko versus Azula. These fights reveal a couple of interesting qualities about the series. The first is that Ozai is a comically uninteresting character, since his only role in the series is as a metaphor for pure evil. And the second is that Avatar has an unfortunate tendency to individualize solutions to systemic issues, so much so that it undermines the systemic critiques that it puts forward. Here's an example of what I mean. The show will argue, correctly, that a militarized nation-state like the Fire Nation will pursue colonial expansion, resource exploitation, and the mass murder of foreign populations. This is true, as history shows that militarized nation-states are wont to do some colonialism and genocide. Where the show messes around is that its proposed solution to the violence of military regimes is to simply replace the head of state. Ozai is a bad guy, but Zuko, he's a good guy. So if we replace the bad guy with the good guy, then the problems will be instantly solved. By personalizing the politics of its world in this way, Avatar often skirts past the inconvenient truths of its world to settle on the radical centrist idea that the way you change the world is by changing the hearts and minds of the ruling elites and by having kinder, smarter people in charge of violent power structures. In reality, the problem with Zuko taking the Fire Nation throne is that his presence alone won't change all of the entrenched problems of the system he will be overseeing. Throughout the series, we see how the Fire Nation has a robust prison industrial complex, commits massive ecological exploitation, has extraordinary capital investment in its military industries, and has deeply effective propaganda in its schools. All of those interests are ingrained into the Fire Nation government, and those interests will be actively working against Zuko. It's strange that in the show's conclusion, it doesn't acknowledge that one good individual can't change a system, because it makes the same argument that I am long before Zuko is crowned, except in the context of the Earth Kingdom rather than the Fire Nation. The Earth Kingdom of Ba Sing Se is a deeply corrupt state. The city is segregated into a caste system, the military leaders are corrupt and secretive and subvert the sovereign king by lying to him or going past him. It doesn't matter that Ba Sing Se's king, Kue, is kind. The system itself is too corrupt for him as an individual to control or fix. 
However, it should be said that the episodes in Ba Sing Se stand out in this regard compared to the rest of the series. Avatar doesn't frequently make these systemic critiques, instead opting to place the causes and solutions to problems on personal actions and responsibility. Even in the instances where the series seems to craft a systemic critique, it often backs out from going all in. In the episode Avatar Day, Aang makes an interesting comment about how the bail system in the small Earth Kingdom village is unjust. How was I supposed to know they wouldn't take Water Tribe money? This injustice, combined with the corruption of the court's judge and the randomness of punishment, paints the picture of a rotten criminal justice system. How is this problem solved? Well, Aang helps out the town and they make an exception for him. I don't blame Aang for helping himself get out of a bad situation. The part that stands out to me is that the episode's celebratory ending frames Aang's victory as if it has also uncorrupted the criminal justice system in the town, even though the system's special interests and the town's culture still favor the corrupt system. The question is naturally asked, why does the show solve many of its interesting political problems this way? When an industrial factory is destroying a small fishing village with its pollution, why is the problem solved by the actions of an individual and then not really litigated beyond that? Personally, I think it's because that idea is simply appealing. For many of us, we live in ways similar to the villagers of the fishing town. Many of us may have a higher quality of life, but our relationship to power is the same. We are at the mercy of what powerful institutions, governments, and corporations do to our environment, water, retirement, our healthcare, with little power to control those aspects of our lives ourselves. As a result, hero narratives like The Painted Lady, where Aang and Gang destroy the deadly factory to save a poor village, are appealing and cathartic. We want to have someone looking out for us and protecting us from these powerful institutions that dominate our lives. And along with that, we also fantasize about being that someone. Avatar and many other hero stories allow us to vicariously live that fantasy. It's sort of the companion appeal of Greek tragedy, except instead of watching powerful people succumb to their flaws, we are watching the weak being protected from the powerful. Even though I'm a postmodern egalitarian neo-Marxist who is dubious of classical ideas of heroism and of grand narratives, I find it satisfying to see these individual stories in Avatar because there's great comfort in stories about people who fight for peace and justice. This doesn't just apply to fiction either, as we often apply this to real life. The fight against slavery in America is often reduced down to names like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, John Brown, and Abraham Lincoln because it's easier to believe in heroes than it is to stand up for yourself and build solidarity with those around you. So while I understand why the show indulges in hero fantasy, what I am more critical of is that Avatar ends the conversation with the idea that societal problems are solved primarily by great people and that it often argues in favor of paternalistic hierarchies. The naturalizing of hierarchies is a big reason why Avatar rarely goes beyond individualized solutions to political problems. This isn't to say that Avatar always believes in the validity of hierarchies, such as when the characters are horrified by the class segregation of Ba Sing Se. But when it comes to moments of action, like when Aang Gang storms the Fire Nation during the solar eclipse late in the series, the show buys wholesale into social hierarchies as necessary structures. Despite the fact that the Water Nomads, Swamp Tribe, and Earth Scientist people have solidarity and take action, they are only able to win because they are aided by the Avatar, an all-powerful being who's more important to the world's struggle for freedom than any of the collective action taken by the people who are trying to free themselves. The show is subtly saying that the vast majority of people are powerless even if they unify and fight as a collective. Avatar is showing us that great causes need great individuals to succeed and normal people need great individuals to guide them, which is wrong. Great leadership is necessary, but Avatar frames leaders from both sides of its conflict as being the whole puzzle rather than just a part of that puzzle. When you look at the final episodes of Avatar, the fight that has the greatest impact on toppling the Fire Nation is Aang vs. Ozai. When Aang successfully takes away Ozai's firebending, the war that has been waged for 100 years ends. is over. Zuko is crowned Fire Lord and everything is... fine? Somehow? Even though all of the military and industrial institutions that profited off of the nation's violent expansion still exist. 
Since politics are so personalized in Avatar, it makes sense that replacing Ozai with Zuko and Aang's role as savior are enough to demilitarize the Fire Nation and end the war. A militarized Fire Nation cannot exist without Ozai, and a peaceful world can only exist because of Aang, or so the show argues. Again, the problem is not that the show has heroes and villains, but that some of the characters, namely Aang, Zuko, and Ozai, are framed as the be-all, end-all of this world rather than a part of a larger ecosystem of struggle and power. It's important to have heroes, because they can inspire us, but we shouldn't become subservient to them or believe that it was their acts alone that won freedom, or justice, or brought peace. Another wrinkle that makes Avatar's political conclusions strange is that it has a brief arc that dismantles the idea that great individuals can reform systems. Much like how the Ba Sing Se arc demonstrates that institutional power can bypass the will of a kind leader, there are a series of flashbacks to Fire Lord Sozin and Avatar Roku that show entrenched institutional power can turn good people violent and cruel. Sozin before and after he takes the throne is basically two different people. He goes from a friendly, loving person when he's young, to a ruthless, bloodthirsty, and paranoid person when he becomes the head of a militarized nation-state. The fact that the show believes that the same won't happen to Zuko as Fire Lord is bizarre because we've seen throughout the series that Zuko's moral compass has been confused and battered by the systems that he exists in, whether it's the pressure of family, military command, or Fire Nation culture. While it may be unfair to say that the show assumes that Zuko could never become a cruel leader like his father, the final sequences of the show are the characters at peace, having fun, and enjoying life. A rarity in Avatar, and a final note that provides positive emotional closure. Even the final interaction between Zuko and Ozai doesn't question what Zuko will do with his newfound power. Rather, it's about him trying to set things right about his mother. But also, this scene is just a disappointment, because the series needed like five more episodes or so to wrap up the story with Zuko's mom, his relationship to his father, and Azula. Like, why does a show this good have such a letdown of tension in the final episode? It's, it's pretty sad, actually. But in the end, Avatar is still a very, very good show, even though I disagree with a lot of its political implications. And I'm glad I finally got over the emotional damage uh, that I experienced in childhood related to the show. But if you're a big fan of emotional damage, don't think we're done here yet. In the next part, we're going to pick up this analysis where we left off. Except in the context of Avatar's sequel series, The Legend of Korra. Why we aren't talking about it right here is simply a matter of time. I don't want to have you here forever. I want us to be, you know, quick. I like to have little bite-sized videos. And I think, anyway, The Legend of Korra is a very complicated series and one that deserves our entire focus. And oh boy, am I excited for it. A lot of people think a lot of things about The Legend of Korra. And we are going to dive deep into that great, great show next time. I hope you guys are excited. And thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.